You're listening to the Music Educator Podcast with your host, Bill Stevens, the 21st Century Music Educator Man. Podcasting from beautiful Leesburg, Virginia. Welcome to the Music Educator Podcast, bringing you the latest tips, tricks, and practical advice you can use tomorrow. Here's your host and fellow music educator, Bill Stevens. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Music Educator Podcast. My name is Bill Stevens. I'll be your host for today. And if this is your first time on the podcast, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're returning, I'm so glad you're back. Today in season four, episode six, we're going to learn about jazz articulations. Here we go. Today's topic dives into the variety of types of jazz articulations. The majority of this information comes from Matt's Holmquist's book, The General Method, a new methodology for a tighter big band. I highly recommend this book for any of you out there teaching or actively performing jazz music. In fact, it's even good just for the overall musician. I'm going to go ahead and leave the information about the book in the show notes just in case you're interested in checking it out. In the past, I would always teach my students the four primary articulations. Tenuto, marcato or short accent, the rooftop accent, and staccato. Many times students would recognize these accents, however, after the first time introducing them, often failed to fully recall them on day two. And that's okay. Articulations need to be reviewed not only for the mental recall, but for also mastering the kinesthetic or the muscle memory side of improving their craft. Young musicians often find it difficult to sustain the energy or mental focus to play a challenging piece of music fraught with regular and mixed up articulations. More times than not, students must be reminded of actively observing and executing these musical nuances. Regular and focused practice of articulations is necessary for large ensembles to stylistically unite or sync in together. I fully believe that the four primary articulations, tenuto, marcato, or short accent, rooftop accent, and staccato should be practiced starting early in a child's musical career. But what comes next? What can my students do to continually improve? Well, my after-school jazz band is typically the group that gets to engage further in the more advanced skill development into articulations. Next, we're going to explore more of what Matt Holmquist's book says about articulations and articulation rules. The brick. Holmquist begins by describing what he calls the brick. This is a symbol that represents a long note that visually illustrates an articulation that looks like a uniform brick. One of the troubles musicians have when they play is that they round out or are careless about the articulation. The brick provides a mental cue to add edge to the beginning and end to a long accented note. The note should begin with a distinctive attack, think more of a marcato accent, and end with a clear energy release. The ant hill. The opposite of the brick could be considered the ant hill. The ant hill attack is similar in the sense of starting with an edge or marcato accent feel However, has a clear phrase ending diminuendo at the end of the note. This type of articulation is much more prevalent in classical music and really only should be used when a diminuendo is notated in jazz music. The Brick Hill. The Brick Hill is a type of hybrid articulation and essentially is a cross between the brick and the anthill. You could describe it as an anthill where the attack is solid, again, think of more of a marcato beginning. However, the phrase ending diminuendos to the end of the beat, however, only at 50% volume. This is opposed to the original anthill that diminuendos 100% within the beat. The dog. The next articulation is called the dog. This is similar to the brick hill. The only difference is that there is actually space between the end of the note and the next beat. The main reason they call this articulation the dog 
is because if it's executed correctly, it sounds like a dog barking and has a bounce-like feel. Distinction of attack. Now this is a helpful articulation rule and the distinction of attack refers to the difference between the volume of the actual note and the accent at the beginning of the articulation. Consider this difference when you are explaining to your students you want to use more or less contrast. Consider showing a note with a forte piano or brick as examples to clarify this visually with your students. Distinction of release. This articulation rule is similar to the distinction of attack, however, concerns the actual release of the note. Most musicians do not often create an accented release of a note. Really, the only stylistically accurate scenario that you would do this would be in funky music, and then many times this is exaggerated. Most times, musicians should play with a release unaccented, however, is often unintentionally played with a diminuendo. Remember, this should only be done if diminuendos are written in the part in jazz music. Energy release. The idea of an energy relief signifies the energy of a phrase ending going to the very end of the phrase. You can envision a sharp end to the release and would sound like a dot, a t. In contrast, classical music often ends with a diminuendo at the end of the phrases, which sounds more like a do, d o o. It is important to recognize that jazz, as well as other African American music, use an energy release, whereas classical music doesn't. Performers in a group who mix up the release styles often create an articulation which results in something muddy. Play with an edge. When Holmquist says to play with an edge, he refers to play with a distinct attack, or rather a big distinction of attack. This can phonetically be played as a big E on a long do note, D-O-O. -O. Ultimately, playing with an edge means sufficient distinction of attack. This concept should be common performance practice for all jazz bands. Tongue cutoff. The tongue cutoff is an articulation technique that happens often in jazz music. This is when the tongue literally cuts off the airstream and sound immediately stops. Doing this could be described as using the T in the dot, D-A-T, articulation. This tongue cutoff is recommended to be used in more traditional big band jazz music. In addition, the tongue cutoff is the preferred means for executing an energy release. In contrast, the tongue cutoff is rarely used in classical music. The inverted accent. The inverted accent creates a really neat effect if all parties involved execute it together and cleanly. Although it can be achieved by all players, the most impressive effect is achieved by the horn players of a big band. This is done when everyone releases a note at the same time with an energy release. The effect and result occurs when the silence itself creates an accent. Unfortunately, if even one person doesn't release at the same time, the inverted accent does not occur. Ones and zeros. The phrase ones and zeros serves as a metaphor for the digital age. In this scenario, ones and zeros describes that there are only long and short notes. This concept encourages players, especially horn players, since rhythm section musicians tend to be more in tune with this concept, to continually ask themselves if they should play short or long. The common stylistic issue is that some musicians play long notes when they should be playing short and vice versa. The short long rule. The short long rule states that you need to exaggerate the difference in performing note lengths that alternate between long and short. The problem arises when musicians are playing music that consistently alternates between long and short. The long note starts to become a little too short and the short note starts to become a little too long. Holmquist points out that in this type of scenario, often the short note has a rooftop accent. He continues to say that you should then follow the rooftop accent rule. This states that rooftop accents should be more emphasized than their surrounding notes. The machine gun. 
The machine gun refers to jazz bands, especially young ones, who have difficulties playing sustained jazz eighth notes. As a result, these players shorten the notes, which it makes it not swing and creates an edgy machine gun effect. Teach your students not to shorten these sustained jazz eighth notes and play what Holmquist refers to as jazz tenuto. Clearly identify that the gap in the sound separates what sounds like a machine gun and use jazz tenuto. The Taw Syndrome Holmquist continues to describe the machine gun effect with what he calls the Taw Syndrome. In a good jazz tenuto style, the performer is phonetically playing do do do, that is D O O D O O D O O. However, the machine gun effect sounds more like the ta ta ta, T A H T A H T A H. The gap between the notes make the ideal do sound sound more like a ta sound. Semi legato. The semi legato is a type of an attack which is one that has a weak attack that almost sounds legato. If a note is to be accented, be sure to avoid the semi legato. Holmquist recommends to first learn to play with an edge, meaning not legato. Once players have full control of this, perhaps try it with music that uses more of a do what feel as opposed to a do dot feel. Legato prohibition. It is Holmquist's opinion that legato should only be used in the following circumstances. Number one, fast moving lines, quick eighth note triplets, 16th notes, or shorter note values. Number two, long background notes. Number three, certain melodic lines. These are commonly found in pop and Latin music rather than swing. And number four, as a soloist, as long as it fits in the context of the musical piece. The long background note rule. Long notes, such as whole notes and half notes, should most often played with a soft tenuto. Often, music is written so that no legato slurs are notated in the music. For musical reasons, background notes should rarely be attacked with accents. Be careful that young musicians don't get too ambitious about having an edge to the note. Long background notes should not be emphasized. The phrasing slur problem. Holmquist points out that few musicians recognize the difference between phrasing slurs and legato slurs. As a result, many players make the mistake of playing legato when they see a phrasing slur. By definition, you would find that the difference between a phrasing slur and a legato slur is that the phrasing slur begins and ends further away from the note head than the legato slur. Problem is, composers often notate both styles exactly the same. As a teacher, you need to communicate to your players the difference between the phrasing slurs and legato slurs and explain what the problem actually is. The triplet rule. This rule implies that whenever you have a quarter note, half note, or triplets of longer value, you should play each note emphasized. Note, this does not include triplets that are eighth note value or smaller. The badger. This is a rule that deals with long notes and type of climax. Think more of a long note that is loud and at the end of a piece. Holmquist recommends thinking of a badger bite. The badger doesn't release until the person is dead or hears the sound of crushing bones. Relating back to the final chords, it is absolutely necessary for players to hold these notes straight and balanced. Often young players may be found unable or unwilling to do this. Be sure to rehearse and practice making these sustained chords a habit, executed in a disciplined manner so that the sound does not end until the director releases them. It is clear to see that there are many types of considerations and issues that jazz musicians must deal with when accurately performing jazz music. Holmquist has some logical points when addressing the why and how to in regards to jazz articulations. For the record, full disclosure, I am not being compensated in any way. However, I highly recommend Mott's Holmquist's book, The General Method, 
new methodology for a tighter big band. I absolutely love this book. It has tons of tips and tricks to help improve your jazz band's performance. Thank you again for joining me for another episode of the Music Educator Podcast. It has been an absolute pleasure to collaborate with lovers of music and educators like you. If you found value in today's episode, please feel free to comment and rate us in the TME podcast app, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast aggregator. Also, check us out on our blog, bandbuzz.org, or our podcast website, themusiceducatorpodcast.com, or our TPT or Boom Card stores. That is all for today. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Music Educator Podcast. For the latest tips, tricks, and practical advice you can use tomorrow, you can subscribe to our podcast on every podcast aggregator or download the Music Educator app for free in the Apple or Google Play app stores. Furthermore, visit our blog at www.bandbuzz.org for additional music education resources. We will see you on the next episode of the Music Educator Podcast. And remember... Music can change the world.